Let's go to the Lord in a moment of prayer, please. Lord, we do thank you so much for your grace and your mercy upon us. I pray that you'll move me to the side so that you can be seen and heard and experienced. In Christ's name, amen. You know, you've you got to love Cammie's spirit. Uh, why don't we do, let's take up another offering. I, I'd like that. Uh, uh, here we go. We're going to do it right now. Sing a song and go right to it. Uh, just love that. And how do you follow up Katie's message? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, uh, how many of y'all have to go to the bathroom right now? I mean, after you get a certain age, you mention it and you just think about it. You got to do, I mean, you got to go do those things. And Oh, they mention it, so I got to go. Uh, but I, I just wonder about that sometimes. I don't know. I want to ask you some hard questions and, and think about some of these hard questions that, that uh, people talk about some. I'm um, going to put a few of them up on the board. But these, these are difficult, hard questions uh, that, that people ask often. Who am I? Is there a God? And if so, who is God? What happened at the beginning of the universe? Some people ask, what is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of my existence? Why am I here? What is consciousness? And how is that different from the guidance of the Holy Spirit? What is right and what is wrong? How can I be happy? Everyone seems to be happy but me. How can I be happy? Why do pain and suffering exist? And how do I deal with them? What is the difference between living and existing? Someone asked me this question recently. What happens after we die? What's out there? What comes? What will you do when you grow up? I used to hate that question. I'm still trying to grow up, but I used to hate that question because that's what people were asking. You get ready to get out of school. What are you going to do when you grow up? Be a there you go. All right. Be a football player. Who are you going to play for? Tennessee. All right. Number one recruit, Tennessee, in a, a few years. There we go. But another question that we really need to think about is a, a very hard question. What will you be? What will you be? It really matters what we decide to be. What will you be? Not what will you do. What will you be? Will you be connected or disconnected? Will you be a, a follower of God or a follower of many gods? Will you be one who is led by the Spirit? are one who is led by many different voices in this world. Will you be led by, as a follower of Christ? I want you to hear this. Will you be a follower of Christ? Are you, will you state your ground as I'm a follower of CNN or Fox News? Right? What will you be? What is it that you will be? Philip, and if you look at Acts, Philip decided to be led by the Holy Spirit. We don't talk about the Holy Spirit a lot. A part of the Trinity that, that the Helper came, Jesus said, I will send you the helper, the comforter, the one who will be with you at all times, the one who will guide you and mold you and shape you and what? Lead you into all life. Philip decided to be led. And you, you hear this. You look at Acts 1, and I want to read just, I, I don't often do this, but I want to look back at Acts 1. It said in, in, in verse 13, it says that, they were, went to a room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, uh, Matthew, uh, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, gathering, 
with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. Acts 2, 43. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and all had things, all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number all who were being saved. Philip decided to be led by the Spirit. And what Jim read for you, and, and if you go back and read it, verse 19, he was led by the Spirit of God to the, to the wilderness road that, that was leading to Gaza. He was led in, in verse, uh, verse 26 to, uh, to, to go from, from Gaza. In verse 29, he was led to go out to, to the chariot, to come alongside the chariot. In verse 39, he was led to another region. He stayed connected with God. We United Methodists are, are good at, at doing, but we cannot forget the part of the of Methodist heritage and what a Christ taught us is to be, to be connected, to, to be in a part of Christ, to, 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 to learn who Christ is for us, to, to be before we do. Here's what we do. We have a little prayer, and then we ask God to bless what we're doing. We, we'll, we'll go and do, and we ask God to bless what we're doing. Ask God, to, we've got our plans, we've got our ideas, we've got our future in front of us. As individuals in the body of Christ, we, we have things said, and then we ask God to bless it. Philip prayed and asked God to direct him where God desired for him to go. Here I am. I will follow you. I'll be directed by you. And I see it too often in our churches, in our individual lives, in my individual life. I, I like control. I want to be in control. I, I want to be the one that, that decides what I'm going to do with my life, with my health, with my finances, with, with everything, uh, with my children, with, with anything around me. I want to be in control. And when you're in control, then you, you can control God too. You can put God in a box, and you can determine what God's side is on and who God loves and who God doesn't love. And you can, you can get God so contained in that box that, that God becomes nothing more to you than, than something that you, you, you pass by and pat, on, uh, uh, the, pat the box and, and, and say, thank you, God, for being here. Not changing, not transforming, not challenging, not convicting, not calling, God becomes something that we control, made in our own image. And when God becomes that to us, we become more divided and more filled with hatred and more angry and more confused and more chaotic and more miserable. When we stop being and only are doing then we start looking at people and saying, how come you're not like me and you're not doing what I'm doing? How come you're not as engaged as I am? How come you're not as spiritual as I am? How come you're not open as minded as I am? How come you're not this? How come you're not that? And it's in being that we understand the gratitude of what God has given to us and cause us to stay in love. Wesley would call this being connected to God, a, a, a staying in love with God. There's nothing wrong. We need to be doing. But as people of God, maybe the means of grace, of prayer, and the scripture reading, and the worship, the fasting, those things are, are just as valuable to us. And they, they, they don't keep God in a box it no longer becomes about you and what you think 
it becomes about where God is leading and what God is calling us to out of ourselves. You know, I, I was looking at this passage and I really thought about thought about this Ethiopian eunuch. This 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 stranger, this person that Philip would probably not associate with. Now he wasn't poor, he was powerful, he had authority. He had people under him. He had trust of, of the queen. He was, he, was, he was really important in, in Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia, just a teaching moment, is the southern Nile region. Uh, it was like some of you historians, the, uh, Nubia. It wasn't where present-day Ethiopia is. It was the southern Nile region. Philip would have probably have had no association with, you know, those people from another area that are strangers. And the Spirit of God, once he stayed and prayed and was connected with God, the Spirit of God sent him out to, to come alongside this Ethiopian, to come alongside and be a neighbor. I love what Bishop Grove said the other night in our Wednesday meeting. He said, if you want to be a witness, first of all, you have to be a neighbor. First of all, you have to come alongside people. You, you have to get to know people. You have to build relationship with people. If you read the scripture, the Spirit said, come along inside the chariot. And, and, and Philip said, he heard him reading. Uh, he said, what are you reading? He said, well, I'm reading the prophet Isaiah. There was conversation started. Come alongside build up trust come alongside and build up relationship come alongside and get to understand people come alongside and and stop finding what's so different from us but find what is so that draws us closer to one another come alongside and, and be a neighbor now I, it's interesting to me once you stay in love with god once you get connected with god then you start to do the things that God is calling you to do and God is asking you to do. And God is asking us to, to be people who, who seek to build relationship with others, to, to be in relationship with others, to, to be kind to others. There's a, a bishop in Zimbabwe that, that uses the word jabazda. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a word that means when you're out in the, you go out in the field, you, you don't go out to the neighbor's field and say, I'm going to plow your field for you. You go along to the neighbor and says, allow me to help you plow your field. Let me build relationship with you. Let me join you. You know, I read this passage. Where did Philip learn that? Where did he learn those ideas to, to be a neighbor? Where did he learn that? He spent three years with Christ. He spent three years watching Christ, listening to Christ, work with all kinds of people. Folks, these days, we've, we've got people so divided and so different that we've stopped looking at what Christ has called us to do for one another, to be neighbor to one another. He, he had the, the nationalist in his, in his group of people, he had the nationalists, those that wanted to take care of, of, of the Jewish state. He, he welcomed them. He didn't say, well, I don't agree with you, so you can't be a part of me. He had the tax collector that was a traitor. They were with the Roman government. He says, I want you to be a part of me. He welcomed the Samaritan, those, those despised despicable, distasteful Samaritans. He entered in the conversation with them. Look at Acts 8. Where was Philip? In Acts 8, where was Philip? In Samaria before he went to the Ethiopian eunuch. Teaching about the kingdom of God and preaching about Jesus. He welcomed the Syrophoenician woman. If you know your biblical text and you understand that text, you remember where the woman says, well, even the, the, the dogs have crumbs from the table. This Syrophoenician woman from the historians was a Philistine, an arch enemy 
of the Jewish people, and he welcomed her to his table. He would welcome the nationalist and the globalist. He welcomed them all to his table, and we've stopped listening to the teaching of Christ. We, we've forgotten that he's called us not to, to be all other things, but to be the neighbor, the one that's willing to go and build relationship and establish relationship with all people in all places at all times. And I hear this word, to be a neighbor is to go and start conversation to establish relationship, to hear and to listen. But there's something else. Philip didn't stop there. I, I find this fascinating. You know, in our United Methodist vows now, it says uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be a loyal member of the Ch United Methodist Church by supporting it with your what? Your prayers. And your witness. Now we've added that in the general conference a few years ago. We used to have your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and we added in there your witness. By your by your doing, it but it matters what you decide to be too. To be a witness. Bishop Grove talked about this, uh, you know, the other night. Uh, of you have to be a neighbor, but you're called to be a witness in interfaith relations don't have to be silent now you have to earn trust you can't just go and, and say this is what I believe and you're wrong for what you believe it's building trust and having conversation but but we don't have to be silent or be ashamed of our relationship with Jesus Christ Philip had, Philip was there talking and 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 he said what what is this that I'm reading, the eunuch says? What is this I'm reading? I don't understand it. And Philip says, well, I'm sorry, I can't help you with that. I got to go. That's beyond me. That's not, that's not what I do. He said, let me tell you about my Christ. Let me tell you about who this is talking about. This is suffering servant. Let me tell you that about this, this man named Jesus who died on the cross. He gave an elevator speech. Do you have that elevator speech? It's, it's two or three things. that This is what Jesus has done. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son to help us see who God really was. One thing, to help us see who God really was. Jesus came to help reinterpret what the world had said about God. God is not the angry, unjust God that you see. God is not the one that everyone else claims to be blaming for all the things that have happened in this world. God is a God of love and grace and mercy and kindness. Look at me. I am a reflection of who God is. And the second thing is, God has come to give you life now to free you from your, from your prejudices, to break down the walls, to help you to find kindness and humility and love and grace. It's a new beginning, Lent. You know what Lent means in the Anglo-Saxon? It means spring. We've turned it into to something that you have to wear around and frown about. Lent is a, it's life. New beginnings, new way of living, new way of relating to God and to one another. It's fascinating if you, re, if you hear this. This eunuch was not allowed in the temple. He was to stay in the court of the Gentiles. He was marginalized. He was outcast. He was not to participate. He was a God-fearer, but he had to keep his distance, and he was not welcome. And here's what Philip is saying to him. You are now welcome into the kingdom of God. You can come and participate and worship and be a part of this new kingdom. You can be baptized and find new life. And it's part of what life God is offering to you. It's what Isaiah said in chapter 56. Listen to this. Isaiah 56, it talks about, it says, For thus says the Lord, 
to the eunuch who keeps my Sabbath, who chose the things that please me and holds fast to my covenant. I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than the sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that they shall not be cut off. He's promising them a new beginning, a new kingdom, a new way of relating. Folks, that's who you and I are. We're kingdom people. We do not live as the world tells for us to live. We live with justice and mercy and kindness and goodness. We live offering hope. Now, Palmer, are you here somewhere? I don't want to embarrass you. There, there over there. She's, uh, but we were talking during Sunday school. Hello? That embarrasses me too, so if, don't be embarrassed. That's okay. I said that one time. If that's, God, if that's not God calling, don't answer it. Um, but there's too many, there were too many surgeons around. They had to go with, they had to, so I didn't say that anymore. Two or three of those doctors came out and said, if that's you that needs the help, you better make sure I get to you. I said, that's right. Okay. I'm not going to say that anymore. That's good. So that's wonderful. Where was I? Um, the, the United Methodist Church over these next few years are still is making some tough decisions we know that and there'll be some articles come out about that in the near future for you to, to look at and all we can do is be faithful to where God has called us to be in conversation with one another and to be a neighbor to one another and to be willing to listen and to hold to our faith. You know, as I, I, I thought about this with this, this eunuch, what Philip did was make himself available. God, I'll, I'll go where you want me to go, and I'll be what you want me to be, and I'll do what you want me to do, and wherever that is, I, I'm, I'm yours. And I think as United Methodist, that is where this, the Holy Spirit sent us as a people out into this world. That's where, where Wesley was said to have talked to Cokesbury, I mean to Thomas Coke and Francis Asbury and, and said, offer them Christ as you go into the new world. In this new world that we live in, will we be those who are faithful. There's a covenant. And I want you to stand with me. We're going to close with this this morning, but it's a covenant prayer. This is the contemporary version of it, but I want us to say it together. Now, this is usually at the New, New Year's uh, service, but I thought of new beginnings in Lent. This would be a great thing. Let's join together in this. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praised for you or criticized for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O oh wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven. Amen.